Welcome to the Resume Storyteller, bringing you interviews with industry experts, regular folks who tested the job search waters and succeeded, and strategies to tell your story and land you job interviews. Here's your host, Virginia Franco. Hey guys, I have with me today bilingual career strategist, Anna Goner, as the founder of Digital Butterfly Communications, Anna helps achievers to say yes to themselves, to set boundaries, and to find healthy work environments. She has spent more than 10 years working for small organizations and also Fortune 500s, where as an HR and career professional, she reviewed hundreds of resumes. Today, Anna teaches successful career strategies to her clients and provides resume and LinkedIn reviews as she motivates and empowers professionals to seek change. She has been featured all over the place, Time Magazine, LinkedIn News, and more. Um, Anna, thank you so much for, for coming on my podcast. I've been following you for a little bit now on LinkedIn. And as I was saying off, off uh, camera and off mic, I just, I love what you're sharing and how you're empowering job seekers. Thank you so much for, you know, for inviting me to be here in your podcast. It means a lot to me as we were, you know, speaking um, briefly before the, the, you know, this recording. I really, really admire you. And it's an honor to be on your podcast discussing, you know, this, this topic with you. Well, I am, I am delighted. Um, and so you heard me sort of give a brief overview of, you know, your career history, but what made you start your practice? Sure. So first I want to start by saying, I like to use the word bilingual career strategist because I am from Brazil and mm -hmm. I want people to kind of know what they're getting before they even speak to me because yes, I have an accent and this is, this is part of who I am. And I, I want people to get that, okay, bilingual means, yeah, she speaks more than one language. Maybe, you know, if, if somebody who is kind of aware, they may say, oh, yeah, they may think, oh, yeah, she probably has an accent or something. That That's part of the reason why I put that there. And what made me start this practice was from my own experiences. I came to the U.S. more than a decade ago, and I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have anybody helping me write a resume, network, interview, right? And in the last more than 10 years, I spent in corporate America. And I noticed that there were so many great people that, you know, I would interview, I would be part of interview panels. And they, they were great on paper sometimes. But in person, you know, they just didn't know how to advocate for themselves, how to yeah. showcase their skills, their experience in a way that would fit the job. So I started getting more involved in that, even, you know, while I was still working in HR. And, you know, I've been through a couple transformations in my life in, with my health. And after the pandemic, you know, and while we were still going through the pandemic, I just decided I wanted to do something more. I wanted to do something in large scale. I wanted to do something that would impact people in a way that they they need, especially when it comes to job search, because we're going to be job seekers at some point, you know, many, many times actually in our, in our lives, right? So... I just, I just had this idea, like, I, I really want to get into the career space. And I was already like helping people, family members, friends sure. with, with their uh, careers. And I was just like, you know, I have enough experience now that I can really like use everything I've learned to help other people. So that's what got me. And what I, I do, what I do today, which is, you know, about boundary setting, setting uh, self-care and the work environment, because those were things that I never had anybody teaching me. You know, I had a hard time, you know, self-care, what is self-care, you know, and that whole idea, oh, self-care is selfish or boundaries. What are boundaries? Yeah. If I, if I set the boundary, I'm going to upset somebody, you know, or I'm not going to be seen as a team player and all these different things. And, and the whole thing about the work environment is that we don't think about the work environment sometimes when we are searching for work. And for many, many years, I didn't understand why I didn't feel like I was a fit or I didn't feel like I belonged where I was. 
And that's all about the work environment, you know, finding the place that actually fits, that works for you, rather than you having to change who you are completely to fit that mold, that the, you know, the, the company culture mold. So, right. yeah. And that, you know, that's, that's such an important part of career management is yes. knowing what your boundaries are, knowing what your deal breakers are. And mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know if some, I don't even know if my listeners know, but I, I'm an immigrant myself, but I came here as a baby. My family came from Uruguay and um, I didn't struggle with these challenges because I'd grown up in the, in, in the U S in American schools and all of that. Um, But my parents struggled with navigating job search. And this was back, you know, pre-digital age. So it was, it was a different landscape, but the same, the, they didn't know how to advocate for themselves. They didn't know how to showcase their skills in ways that help them land jobs. They certainly didn't know anything about picking the right work environment that would would fit fit their their unique uh, deal breakers and things like that. And so, I feel like that's an added. It's hard enough for people that are born and raised here to do that, much less someone who is coming in from a new com- new country and and a different culture. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. And and when we, feel, as you said, like it's not just immigrants, right? It really, it really depends on how you were raised because the whole thing about boundary setting and what I talk about mostly is the, the, the workplace, not necessarily with your relationships, you know, and, and your family sure. members, but in the workplace, because we fear, you know, not being liked and we fear saying no to more work because in the hustle culture it's all about more right can you take on more can you do more because that's the only way we we have this thing ingrained in our in our brain sometimes that the only way to get a raise or to climb that you know invisible ladder is to always say yes to more and next thing you know you're working 60 hours a week you have no social life you don't have time, you know, you can't spend time with your family, or if you are with your family, you are worried about work. And it's just like, and, and again, boundaries is not just about, you know, when we f- think about boundaries, the, the word no always comes to mind, right? But it's not necessarily about saying no, and more and more about, okay, like, how are people treating you? Like, do they just toss work? And without asking you if you can take on more, like how, because I remember being, you know, in jobs before where I would have a manager say, I remember, you know, it's something that was completely out of, you know, the, the things that I was supposed to do. And they would come mm-hmm. and say, can you do X? And I was like, um, but this is usually, you know, somebody else's work because I didn't know how to do it. So I had to learn somebody else's work to get that done and say yes to that because the manager already asked three other people and three other people said no, but Anna would say say yes. Right. So I I grew up, this is, this is the way I was raised is it was, and you know, many people in Brazil, maybe they were raised a different way, but my, in my household, people's needs always came first. I would always be the last one on that list because it was all about giving and helping. And and I came to the US with this mindset until, you know, I worked for many years in, in, in corporate America and I realized that I was having all sorts of health issues, health issues and and doctors didn't know like the cause, right? Because here I feel like we're very good at disease management. But sometimes we have a hard time with root cause, right? Like how can we find the root cause? And the root cause, after going to so many doctors, I realized it was stress, you know, anxiety, uh, burnout, all these different things that we get from, you know, working, working and hustling and all these different things. And it's just, you know, it it, it was really hard to navigate all of that and keeping a full-time job and working many hours to, and and I'm an achiever, which means Mm -hmm. you're going to give me, uh, you know, work and I will get it done no matter what. And I even joke sometimes that getting things done is like, those are my favorite words because I really get things done. And the more you have on your plate, the harder it gets to, you know, achieve everything on that to-do list. 
And next thing you know, it's like, it's almost like you feel like you're failing yourself. Um, it, it's that feeling that, you know, I, I can't, I can't cross everything off this list, or I have to give up my free time to be able to go over that list. And that list means sometimes it's everything related to work. It's not even related to yourself. Like for more than 10 years, like I didn't do anything, meaning I didn't have a lot of hobbies. I wasn't, you know, dancing is a big deal for me. I wasn't doing that. Um, I, I was really focusing on, and I, I wrote this before, I was really focusing on being somebody in America. That was a big deal um, for me. Like I really wanted to, you know, I, I had corporate jobs in Brazil, but I really wanted to get back in corporate America. And it just, just climbed that ladder, right? Because that's where everybody well, is. I, I, I do feel like these things or, you know, everyone does is raised with different mindsets to your point, but something happens when you are immigrating to a new country where you, it's even harder to say no and to not keep hustling because you are, you're trying to achieve in a, in a whole new place, mm -hmm. um, which, and you don't always, you know, you're you're sort of learning the norms of the country and all that as you go along. So it's it's just an added challenge to be able to set boundaries and um, even think about things like self care. You know, you've yep. got sort of higher level, I guess, priorities that you or things that you deem as priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, and are are there other? Is that a common barrier that you see faced by? job seekers from other countries, maybe who English isn't their primary language, maybe even people from other countries where English is their primary language. Um, is that a common obstacle or do you also see other ones? Oh, this is one of the many. <laughs> yeah. I see many others, including, I would, I would give you one, you know, you're probably familiar with this resume writing. It's a big one because you know in different countries sometimes the way you set up your resume is different and there's also language barrier as you know besides writing a resume because there's always that thing oh you want to showcase you know your skills and experience and knowledge in that piece of paper right like and and writing it's hard sometimes even if you are a native english speaker Right. I know I know plenty of native English speakers and they have a hard time with resume writing. Mm -hmm. So I would say resume writing is it's a hard one for me. When I first came here, I, you know, I relied on libraries. I went to the public library. I got books and whatever, whenever they had workshops, this was kind of how I learned how to write a resume because I didn't know. Wow. Um, oh, yeah. I, I really had to like work hard and, and kind of advocate for myself and try to figure out how to do things because couldn't afford coaching, couldn't afford a resume writer. And I didn't have a person to rely on to pave the way for me, meaning this is what how you do this, this is how you do that. So there was a lot of what I like to call trial and learning because, you know, uh, it's kind of how I like to call it because it's just learning different things and trying to figure out, okay, if I build my resume this way, is this the right way? If I build it, am I getting any results? If I try a networking event, you know, how am I supposed to present myself and all these different things? So it was just reading, watching videos and trying to get, you know, free resources. And, and this is what I would encourage people to, if they really can you, what do you recommend for people in I, your shoes today? Absolutely. Like I would say, if you can uh, work with a resume writer, go for it because um, it's hard trying to figure everything out on your own, but if you can't, uh, maybe check your local library, public libraries. Sometimes they have free workshops and books and things that you can try. And, you know, cause there's so much buzz all over the internet. Sometimes it's really hard to find, okay, what kind of, you know, template is good for me or what kind no, of advice should I there's so much noise. It's really hard. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. And sometimes like, okay, am I mid-level? Am I an executive? Am I, am I entry level? It's just kind of really right. hard to understand how do you build that resume, right? So if you can't afford it, and I would say, when I say that, I would say, 
don't go on certain platforms and pay like, you know, a few bucks and believe that your resume is going to be top notch because sometimes whoever is writing may be using a template and may not, you know, even like work for you. So when I say that, I would say work with somebody you know, maybe it's it's a referral for somebody else, somebody mm-hmm. who has maybe certifications and things like that, because I think that matters. You want to work with a reputable person who can really help you and, and you know, talk, work with you, work with you, meaning yeah. they are going to ask you the right questions and extract all these different things that sometimes you believe, oh, I just did X, meaning you don't believe that was a big deal, but that's exactly what they need you to do in you know, this, this next job or something. So I, I would say resume writing, it's a big deal for a lot of people. Understanding the US job market for those who you know are not from the States, they come here, you know, maybe for school and then they have to find a job and and all these different things, understand visas, work visas and all these different things is important too. Um, And how the market works, the hiring process, how is the hiring process, you know, just try to gather information to understand more because it may be quite different than the hiring process in your country. That's right. Yeah, the market, the U.S. market was quite different for me, you know, more than 10 years ago coming from Brazil because I worked in Brazil. I've been working since I was a teenager and I had already full time work experience in companies. So coming here, I knew how to write a resume in a way that in Brazil, you know, years ago. You would add ID numbers, you know, let's say your driver's license right, your, number. Yeah, your marital status, all of exactly, that. Exactly, date of birth and all these different things, sometimes even photo and all that. But now, you know, things are changing. But in some countries, that may still be the norm, you know, or, or in, I know there are differences between, you know, let's say a resume that you're going to use in Europe and a resume that you're going to use in North America. So it really depends. It depends on the position you're going for and all these different things. So it's important well, to understand the market. So for those that might be listening from Latin America, um, what are the main differences between resumes and job search here in the U.S. versus the down there thing, I know, and i know brazil yeah. is different from colombia you know yeah. but generally generally speaking i would say the main thing i see because yeah those whole, the whole thing about you know the, the the things that would be illegal in the u.s to ask like you know, date of birth marital status you know id you know documentation and things like that i think the whole latin america you know market they're getting away from those things now because there's so many american companies all over you know i can i can't speak for brazil both of my siblings that work for american companies so there's so much of that all over that it's almost like they're harmonizing the hiring process in a way that okay. they're using ATS that they use in, in the US. They might try to use the same system in Brazil. And even like when, you know, you, if you do like a quick search on the internet, you're going to see the same kind of big companies that work on resumes that have resume templates in the US. They also have, you know, the same templates. Um, Interesting. Or, yeah. Yes, yes. So, so, the, the, like, so the the U.S. style resume is becoming global. I would say so. I would say so. Yeah, because I, I think it's almost like they're trying to harmonize the whole hiring process and not, you know, because I I heard this before. It doesn't mean that because something is not in your resume that in Latin America they're not gonna ask you in an interview. Hey, this job requires you to travel. Like, uh, are you married? Do you have children? Do you have this and that? Is that going to impact your job? This can still be questions that somebody may ask behind, you know, closed doors in an interview. But I would say, like, when it comes to, like, the hiring process, I don't think this would be elimination questions. You know what I mean? They wouldn't have those kind of questions in ATS or they wouldn't expect you to add this kind of information in your resume. So I would say in many ways, but one thing that I wanted to mention is that in the US, we really, um, I see, you know, and especially when people are trying to change careers, like volunteer experience, we, we tend to recognize that, 
right? So if somebody wants to, I don't know, get into HR and they start doing volunteer work somewhere, they can add that to their resume and that may add some value, right? Depending on what they're right. doing, the activities. But what I see sometimes, I, I can, you know, speak, you know, from, from my own country is that volunteer work is not something that we put a big emphasis on. It's more about continuous work experience. Like, can you really do the job? Like, are you climbing the ladder? Are you seeking? And another thing that I see um, in, in Brazilian resumes is the, the you know, education. That's, that's a big one. It's not just about going to a university and getting a degree, but like continuing education. Are you taking classes, courses? Are you up to date with the market? Which is something that we also value here. But I feel like there, it's more like the progression, you know, the work experience, the continuous work experience and learning. Learning is, if they want to you know, stay up to date. You say that because I have worked with many that where they have PhDs and yeah. I'm like, why did you have a PhD for this job? But I see what you're saying. It's because, it's because that continual advancement of education is, mm -hmm. is there's value, there's a value in that. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say that's the experience. I mean, the, the volunteer work, yeah, you know, maybe you volunteer in something that relates to your job and you want to add to your resume and you're going for a position in Brazil. That may work, you know, that, that may add some value, but I would say it's more on the progression and also education. And I, I see in the US, depending on the position, that volunteer work has you know some some importance like you know that that may help you get a different job so i think those are the differences that i see that's really interesting do you so brazil is such a huge company uruguay where i'm from is you know teeny tiny and so career change really isn't a thing mm -hmm. that i have seen amongst my family members they pretty much you sort of pick a path and continue your education continue the ladder but you stay in that path um you don't see the pivoting that people that I have no, seen here. Is that it's, no, I, I, yeah, it's, it's yeah, everything you're saying makes sense because in the US, as they say, and honestly, it's how I also feel and what I've have experienced, this is the land of opportunities, meaning you can be whoever you want. Like you can start a career and you can, you know, change and you can do different things. And I feel like here it's more common and more acceptable. But in Brazil, it can be a it can be trickier, I would say, because again, like you went to school for I don't know HR, and now you want to do finance. But in order to do that, like how are you going to get that education? How are you going to get somebody right. to see that you can do this other thing? You know what I mean? So, and here I feel like yeah, you went to school for something else, but maybe you took a certification, a course, a class, you did some right, volunteer you use work. That volunteer experience to make yes, that. Yes, um, absolutely. Okay. I would say it's 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 harder to do that, at least in Brazil. It would be harder to do that. I mean, but certainly is certainly yeah. is your as big as West Virginia. So it's very it's very hard. Yeah. Um, oh, that's so interesting. Um, well, in terms of of understanding the you know the the job search landscape, we talk a lot about you know writing your resume, but also networking. Um, mm -hmm. You know that not just focusing primarily on applying online. Uh, can you speak about some of the challenges maybe you faced or you see um, newcomers face when well, it comes I would, to networking? Yeah, I, I would say the first thing, um, and I would say for many people, that may be even harder than writing a resume, it's speaking. Yeah. It's speaking because when, I, I mean, my whole experience with networking, when I first started, I remember going to, you know, events and, as soon as I opened my mouth and said, oh, you know, I'm in school, I'm earning my MBA, I'm doing this, like people would just like turn around and go speak to someone else because it's it's self it's it's about self-confidence too, right? It's like, yeah. oh, in my country, before I came to the US and I learned English on my own. And when I was, you know, in college, that's when mm -hmm. I, I had I yeah, I had money to pay for classes and stuff. And when I first came here, I thought, oh, my English is good enough. Like I can speak, but you freeze. 
it's almost like you know when everybody's speaking English, English, and, and you feel like I cannot speak like them. And then you start the comparison game and all these different things. So there's a lot of self confidence that you know sure. is really hard. Um, sure, because there's lingo and yeah. and in any language that you don't learn in school, right? No, I mean, and that's the thing when you're learning a language. Um, you always focus on grammar and learning things in a certain way. It's almost like you have to go through from A to Z, that whole path in order to learn the language. But from my experiences, as you know, I am a language learner myself, still learning different languages. I feel like sometimes what you need to do is forget about some of that and just focus if you're here for work, you know, figure it out the whole job search, like, you know, in business English might be really beneficial, right? Try to learn. That's what I did. I, I took some ESL classes, business English classes, and all these different things to learn more about the language of business. Then I did the same for HR. I wanted to learn because there's a lot of jargon yeah. behind the scenes that you need to know. But when you're just in a you know language school learning a language, they're not going to teach you that. They're no, not going they to teach you that. So it's important sometimes, I would say, to be strategic the way you're learning the language. So if you want, you know, like I was saying, a job in HR, like learn that language, read books about human resources and maybe take ESL classes towards business. And so you, you get more familiar with that world. Rather than continue to learn, you know, your grammar and, you know, sentence structure and those things are important and I'm, I'm not saying they're not, but I would say if you don't, don't understand the language for the kind of job you want, you know, how are you going to talk in an interview? Like when they ask you a question and there's a word there that you never heard, but it's part of, you know, uh, something that you have to do on a regular basis and you don't know what that means, that may be tricky. So I would say, you know, when you look at job descriptions, is there something there that you don't understand? Try to learn more about it. What, what does this word mean? What do they want me to do in this job? You know, and, and you can always speak with people, you know, doing the job, people in the industry. Try to make connections if you want a specific job with people already doing that kind of job. So I would say, you know. Oh, that's such good advice. And yeah. I feel like people... Res not the word is not respect, but they sort of consider you knowledgeable when you can speak the terminology versus whether you're putting a sentence together correctly. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll say that a million times because it's <laughs> because not well, about Americans by nature are horrible grammarians. <laughs> a lot of them are <laughs> self-included. Thank God for Grammarly. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I would say you know, when we are speaking and writing it, two different things, right? Like you write, sometimes it has to be a little more formal, but when we speak, it, it, of course, you need to think about the tone, you know, because you can say the same word. You can say no, for example, in a very calm and, you know, non-threatening way, but you can mm -hmm. say no in an aggressive way, right? And that's just one word. But I would say it matters more when you understand the language of that, you know, field, that industry, because, and I'll say this, and it's something that I suffered, you know, before, for having an accent sometimes, you know, because you have an accent, people don't see you as smart. And, you know, it, it's just because, oh, this person is still learning the language. They don't understand what we're doing here. They don't understand us. But when you show up, like you said, and you understand the language, then it's like, oh, they may not speak, you know, put sentences together perfectly, but they understand what we're talking about here. They understand what we need. You know, they understand the job description. They understand our company, the values, the mission, all these different things. So I think yeah, it's a great yeah. way to mitigate that bias. Yes, absolutely. And what I would say, too, is like maybe try to find a diverse group of people who, you know, just like you. They came to this country, they didn't know the language and ask them how they did it, how they got, you know, into their fields, how they got to learn the language and all these different things that may be helpful too. How did you find people that had gone through that? So I, I had some friends, I mean, they're, they're not around anymore, but at the time they knew other people and it's just kind of 
who do you know, right? And and yeah. it's that web of people. And then, you know, there were family members, you know, at, at the time who also kind of tried to have, oh, speak to this person, speak to that person. And it's just, this is, it's just like learning, speaking with people. I knew, you know, a lot of Brazilians and people from other countries, and some of them were already working in, you know, corporate. So they gave me some tips, like, try this, try that, speak to this person, or, you know, go to this networking event, or learn this, learn that. So it's just kind of, it, it's a lot of relationship building. I would say I'm not saying I I have I have yet to meet anyone who has come here to work in corporate America that doesn't know someone that they can say who do you know and start build as you said building that web you have to there's no other way like for me that kind of that helped me you know find a job that helped me because sometimes we're here we don't know anybody and we feel like I mean it, it like I said, I had a lot of Brazilian friends and they knew other people. And that's kind of the way that I got to know, you know, other people and they spoke more, you know, English because we started making friends with, you know, people right. who were just speaking English. So when we were together, we had to speak English. So that forced me to, you know, speak the language and, and all of that. And it's just, you have and those to have conversations that really do help you to understand the landscape that you're dealing with. What's, what's what's the job market like? What's the industry like? What's, you know, and get you in touch with people that know that stuff and can yeah. help who have been there before you. Absolutely. Really and and I know it can be hard because I am an introvert and I know it can be hard for a lot of people, but I'm not saying you should get out there and try to meet 50 people, you know, a month, but I would say it's small steps, right? Today yeah. I met this person. I asked this question. I'm struggling with this. This person, you know, said, read this book or talk to this person, they may be able to help you. And, and and this is what I would advise people to do. I know it can be hard as an introvert, but the other thing also is you have to speak up. Like the only way you are going to learn a language is by trial and learning. To this day, there are many words that I still may pronounce, you know, wrong, but I, I, I it is what it is, you know, I, I just like, I learned that I have to put myself out there. I want to speak up. I want to help mm -hmm. as many people as possible. And the only way to do this is by not being afraid of being myself. I love that. And I challenge anybody who, who, who might think less because it's not said perfectly to try to do one tenth of what you do in another language. So mm -hmm. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I would say something too, though, that came to mind. Um, don't underestimate yourself by saying, oh, my English is no good. I am so sorry. And then you become super like over apologetic. Everything. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know because I did that. And I, you know, a couple of people told me you don't need to apologize every time. So I learned, you know, I learned my lesson because I feel like instead, like you can say, I've been here for X amount of time, or you don't even need to mention the amount of time you've been here. You can just say, I'm still learning the language. If you don't understand- So many people are impressed at, at how right. much you can communicate another language because yeah. so many people here cannot. Yeah, no, absolutely. Just, just, just say, if you don't understand something I'm saying, let me know. Just, right. you know, right. please ask right. me. And I've done that and, you know, and it, it worked because then you were already breaking the ice. Right. Meaning I know I already know that I have an accent. I already know that I'm learning the language. So if you don't understand something, let me know. Instead of being my English is terrible. I'm not very good because <laughs> you're internalizing those words. Yeah. There's your mindset, too. Right. You are internalizing. I am not good enough. My English is not good enough. It, things are never going to work because I can't improve my English. And and you start internalizing those things without realizing that you're saying these things to yourself over and over and to other people, right? So before they even speak with you, you're already like, you know, putting your, your defenses up, like my English is not good. I'm terrible. I'm sorry. You know, and, and that might be the thing that they remember about you. So instead you can just say, I'm, you know, I'm still learning the language. If you don't understand something I'm saying, just let me know. 
So love that. I love that. Are there sort of common job search mistakes that you see your clients making? And maybe, um, maybe it's because they're from a new country. Maybe it's just because they don't know job search. Period. Um, but what are commonalities that that you find that you're constantly trying to coach against? Um, there's so many. <laughs> Oh, no. Let me go over yeah, a couple I'm here. One or two. <laughs> yeah, and the, the first one here, you you know, you're probably familiar with is the generic resume. The generic resume that you built as a static document that is this prehistoric thing that everything you have done in the past that talks has nothing to do with the job you want to do next. And that's just right. When I say, when I tell people, you need to build your resume forward for the job you want, not the job you have or had in the past. They don't understand that because they still have that kind of mindset that it's, it's a historical document talking about the different things that you did. And then they expect the recruiter, you know, or the hiring manager to look at the document and figure um, it out based on yes, that. How is this person going to fit the position I have available? And yeah. that, that's just not, that's not well, how and I, you know, and I, Yeah, I see that all the time as well. And I was just speaking with a client earlier today and, and, and I said, if, look, if someone takes it with a fine tooth comb and looks at everything in your resume, then maybe they can pick and choose and figure out how you'd be a good fit. But I can't think of anyone who's going to do that. No, recruiters are busy and the hiring managers are hiring busy. managers are busy. Even our mothers don't take the time to read through with the fine tooth comb. So your job is to pull the bits and pieces that show how you're a good fit for whatever that target is and mm -hmm. get rid of the rest. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And the other said yes, no, yes, yes, that's it. And the other thing that I see that goes along with what I do, you know, about the work environment is that people wait until the last minute to realize that they need a new job. Then they need a new job yesterday <laughs> and they'll go, yeah. you know, to the big job boards and they'll just apply away. They don't research the company. They don't really research the opportunity. They may barely read the job description once. And it's, it's their mindset. It's a scarcity mindset of take a chance on me. I'm desperate. I need, you know, I need this job. And I understand, yeah, if you are a job seeker, yeah, you want a new job. But when you don't take the time to figure it out if that company, that work environment, that place is going to be a good fit for you, you may end up job searching again after three months on the job yeah. because you realize it's not a good fit. You're not in the right environment. You don't like what you're doing. So if you can, of course, and I, understand not everybody has you know the time to really take some time to job search because it is a full-time job depending on how you're going you know the position and what you want to do next you're going to have to you know really work hard but i would say that it's really important to try to figure it out if that company culture the work conditions even if you know you really need a remote job, but this company is only offering on site, I mean, I, are you really applying for that job? Do you really meet the qualifications? Because what I see also is when people tell me, oh, I applied to hundreds of jobs and I haven't heard back, I got one interview or something along those lines, I always ask them, but tell me how you're job searching. And then I start asking mm -hmm. more questions, you know, just to kind of understand. And then you get the, the generic resume, going to big job boards without uh, a strategy, with, without a goal, or trying to figure it out, you know, 10 years ago, I did X. I think I want to do X again without really reflecting if what they did 10 years ago is suitable for them today. Right. For example, if 10 years ago you were doing some sort of job that required you to be outside and today, you know, you don't want to be doing work outside anymore. You really want to sit at a desk and stare at a computer and that's what suits you. Or you have a family, a young family, or you need to be home because you are a caregiver to somebody. It's just like, why are you trying to apply for jobs that 
you already know may not be a good fit for you. Or sometimes you don't even think about those things before you hit apply because it's so easy, right? There's the easy apply button in place. That's right. You know? no. and, and so what I'm hearing you say is the strategy has to come first. And that strategy is what am I targeting? Yes. What company? What's the fit? What are my deal breakers? And then you write your documents mm -hmm. around that. Like the, the target strategy informs everything. No, I absolutely are, because I also think hungry. that they can reduce your job search. Um, you know, sometimes it can help you reduce your job search because. You are targeting specific companies, specific jobs, and oh my gosh, yeah, it feels like it's so much more work. But I I've said this before; it's like a Disney yeah. World fast pass. Like you will absolutely get to the front line yes, by doing yes. all this, no, and you get absolutely. on the right quickly, <laughs> quickly, yeah. But you've done a bunch of work, but it's it's smart work, and it will mitigate the chances that you will then land somewhere where you're like, oh, that was a mistake. <laughs> no, yeah, I need to do this it again. Helps, yeah, it helps with networking too, right? Because yeah. you're not targeting the entire world. You're targeting a specific industry, a specific company. And maybe I always tell people, if you can, you know, if, if you have the time, try talking to people who are, you know, working for that company. Try to learn more. Do they walk the talk? You know what I mean? Like right. it's beautiful. Right. Anybody can create a beautiful website. And, you know, post a couple of things on the internet, but it's like on the day to day, is that really how they operate? Again, that's all about the work environment. It's, it, it's why I, I go on and on about this because sometimes we allow the big names, you know, big companies in, in big industries. Oh, mm -hmm. I really want to work for X because this would look good on my resume, right? But right. then you may even get after an extensive hiring process, you get the job in a couple of months, you know, during that role, you realize, but I barely have time for myself. Or, you know, I really don't like the fact that I need to show up three days a week in the office. I rather be home or I don't like the work conditions. I, I, right. I don't have bureaucracy. It drives me crazy because it's such a big name. Yeah, exactly. It, it, yeah, sometimes yeah. people chase that rather than chasing what may be a good fit for them, right? And and the, yeah, the, it's part of the reason why I do what I do because I feel like is it's important to find that what works for you, what's going to be a fit for you, you know, in in the long run, rather than I just want the big name. Yeah, no, really good advice. Um, well, we've talked about, we touched on this before um, a little bit with, you know, talking about ways to overcome the language barriers and your self-confidence around, you know, English as a second language. Um, but there, there are lots of ways that people can be discriminated against when it comes to hiring practices. So we talked about language, but there's also, you know, racism, sexism, ethnicity, all of that stuff. Um, what Talking about, since you're an immigrant and since that represents some of your clients or many of your clients, how do you advise clients to sort of navigate discrimination that they might face related to that? Mm -hmm. So if you believe a company doesn't want to hire you because of your age, your gender, your ethnicity, that place doesn't deserve you. That That's kind of how I want to approach this because... Okay. Early in my career, um, I received this advice that I had to take accent reduction classes because otherwise nobody would take me seriously in the workplace. And what? yeah, and it was just, or, you know, a couple other things that I heard here and there that if I allowed, you know, those thoughts, people's opinions, because those were opinions of me mm -hmm. or how I dressed, like I used to straighten my hair because I, you know, back, you know, a couple years ago, and two, I would say a couple years ago, and two couple years ago, like showing up in the workplace with curly hair, it's almost like your hair is messy. You are giving advice to try and fit in. Yeah, it, it, it's just like there's all these different things that people sometimes make you believe that you have to do to fit in, buy expensive clothes, dress a certain way, go to certain places just to feel like 
you have to fit in, but you, you're not going to belong because again, you're not being yourself. You're trying to fit a mold, right? So I feel like if you believe that X company is gonna not going to hire you because of age or you know ethnicity, gender, that place doesn't deserve you. I know it's hard to navigate because this exists and I'm not overlooking. I'm not saying that, oh yeah, it's just in your head. And the desire to fit in is a natural human yes. tendency. Right? Oh yeah, we want but to I be like if you even if you fit in, you might not belong because you're not being your true self. I think that's no, because what, belonging is about you know interpersonal, you know, relationships, like how you relate to people in the workplace, right? So if you you're changing who you are just to be a part of that environment, it's almost like you are, you know, you are too people like in, at work you have to be a different person and if we all you know of course we all at work we might be right, a we all have serious. our personal selves and our personal absolutely self, but. yes but what i'm saying is like you feel if you think you have to i don't know i need to get like <laughs> i'm just gonna say here i need to do something to my face so i can appear younger because everybody at work looks young or I need to dress a certain way. So, you know, in, in my show that I fit with everybody else, I feel like it's not belonging because that's not the no. real you. You're just so doing how do something. You, how do you advise people to find companies where they could be their authentic selves and really belong? Yes. And that when research comes around, I would say before, if you can, before you even apply for a job, do research, research the company, Re talk to people if you can doing the job or inside the company or former employees and try to understand like, okay, like, do is there anything that they say that sounds like a red flag to me? Sometimes some, even reading job descriptions, you, you know, if they say, I, I remember reading one recently that had like fast paced dynamic, all these different languages that pretty it much really gave means me, no work life balance, right? Absolutely. And that's what I'm saying sometimes. And, and that can be an issue, right? And that can be a way of discriminating people too, because if you, you know, if you have a family and you have young children, you know, you're going to have to be there for them more often than somebody who doesn't have that, right? So it's like, okay, this person who needs to do this job, they have to be available for the company every day all the time. And I know I can't. So it's already in a way kind of eliminating some, somebody, you know? Yeah. Um, so I would say so just read, do, read between do the lines of job description, talk to people that are there, talk to people that have left. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, I think research, if you can get the research done before you apply, or maybe if there's a deadline, apply for the job. And then if they contact you and you realize, you know, after doing your research is not might not be a place for you, you can always say, no, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, but it's not the right fit for me, right? No, so, no, really good advice. No, and and what are your thoughts on looking at um like going to LinkedIn and looking at the people that work there, like looking at their pictures? Um, like there's people that maybe look like you, dress like I you. Feel like, yeah, I feel like in a way, like we all, you know, when when we when we put you know our our pictures out there, we all want to mm -hmm. appear you know a certain way. Um, yeah. So pictures can be deceiving. That's but I, I wouldn't say like it's something that I, I I advise my clients, you know, anytime I do like a resume, you know, a LinkedIn review is put an, a, an updated picture there. Like, you, you know, it, maybe if you if you believe you need to work with somebody to get, you know, your your picture taken, but or maybe use your phone or something. But <laughs> I remember seeing uh, photos and then speaking to people and realizing that the photo that they had on LinkedIn was like 20 years ago. So, yeah, oh my gosh, yeah, no, I've seen that, yeah. That, and then this right. is what I advise them, like you may want to take, you know, a picture and, and show up as, as yourself because even if you interview, you know, not, not in person because these days is mostly, you know, through the camera, they're going to see what you look like. And, and they shouldn't go by looks, they should go by your experience and skills. And if they are going by looks, then... That's not a place for you. You know, I, I know it's hard to understand this piece, but it, it, it really makes sense. Like when I say, if you see that there's bias there, the bias is not going to go away. 
You know, if you're starting a job where you already sense that there's bias because of your age or what you look like or whatever it is, it's just going to continue. That's right. No, that's a really good point. So do, I, I ask this question a lot of my guests. Um, so I'm going to ask it of you. Let's say you are at a dinner party and someone comes up to you and says, I heard this is what you do for a living. I'm getting ready to go on a job search. What are one or two things that I have to do to get started? What do you, what would you say? So first thing I would say is try to understand the market or the industry you're going, you know, maybe try reading, you know, books or things on the internet or following reputable career coaches on the internet. Sometimes they put great stuff out there just to kind of learn more. Okay. What is the market looking for at the moment? Especially if you can get somebody in your industry, because yeah, a lot of us have niches where we're talking about, I don't know, um, pharmaceutical, you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry or, you know, finance and different things like that. Um, the second thing is, Again, I always I always like to think of the strategies and, and the research. It's like figure it out where you are and what you need, meaning sometimes we believe only like, you know, having a good resume is going to be it. That's all we need. But, you know, maybe writing is not your thing and then you hire somebody to help you. But how are you doing with interview? <laughs> you know, because like I said, I remember a lot of people being good on paper but then when it came to interviewing it, it just didn't match like the the person well, that yeah to so figure out sort of what 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 part of the job search yeah you may not... need help maybe you need help right. with everything right like um career clarity that's a big one because a lot of people think they know what they want to do or sometimes oh, i'm just going to look at you know a job board and see if there's something there for me that's not the way to go i really think you need to figure it out okay what do i want to do next and then if you need help maybe you need help with the entire career pro you know the the job search process then if you can afford to hire somebody or like i said there's so much free advice on the internet it's just a matter of finding somebody you really like you you like what they have out there they have good reviews you know recommendations and things like that and try to figure it out you know what you need do you need clarity do you need a resume do you need a linkedin you know new linkedin profile do you you help with interviewing yeah. and, and you're right yeah. Build it, whether you do it through paid or through research or through yeah. free resources no really really good advice because there are lots of places where job search can break down yeah um no very good um so anna you have had a very busy year um Tell me, so as we're recording this, it's, we're in November of 2022, almost at the end of the year. What is on your agenda for 2023? What can you share? Yeah, so it's mm -hmm. been an amazing year for me. I've I've done things that I didn't even, you know, I don't know, they just happen. And, you know, it, I mean, of course, there's a lot of hard work behind the scenes that nobody sees. Um, but I, for 2023, I, you know, I am working on the website. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm working on it myself. But of course, you know, at some point I am going to hire a person to work on different things and improve and all this. But for now, I'm just I'm just doing my thing. I'm just learning a little bit. Um, I'm also working on some guides and things like that. They're all going to be free. I'm, I'm working on three of them at the moment. I just want to really help people, you know, where they are right now and see if what I, maybe the things I put out there are going to be beneficial for them. And yeah, that's, I'm working on these three things too. I'm also working on a newsletter that I want to have, you know, once a month, maybe twice a month, um, around the things that I talk about boundaries work environment and you know self-care and all these things uh and of course related to job search and careers because you know that's what i do um yeah. and i'm also working on a course that i want to have probably q1 or q2 next year and that course is going to be all about boundaries in the workplace because like i said i work with boundaries in the workplace because i think those are a little bit easier, even though we don't think they are 
setting boundaries in the workplace rather than setting boundaries sometimes with family members because those are longer yeah, so relationships. Start with, start with not your, don't start with your parents. No. Your <laughs> so yeah, that's what I'm working on. And what I also want to do is when it comes to social media, I want to put more videos out there, uh, you know, work more on my YouTube channel and continue to, you know, post and, and work on LinkedIn. So those are the things oh I have God. on my agenda. Lots of, <laughs> yeah, lots of exciting materials. And so if people want to follow you and have access to this, I have shared your LinkedIn and then your website, um, anagoner.com, and also your YouTube channel. Are those the best places to um, for people to find you and learn more? Yes, those are the best places for now. Like I said, the website, by the time this, you know, this episode goes live, is probably going to be live. Um, if not, yeah, it's coming. <laughs> I'm working on it. But yeah, those those are the best place to find me. Well, Anna, thank you so much. Um, this was this was wonderful. I love getting to know you. I love your advice for people that are um, new to the country. But so much of your advice applies to people that have been here a long time. So super applicable. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate this opportunity and it was a pleasure to speak to you about this. You've been listening to The Resume Storyteller with Virginia Franco. To learn more about storytelling strategies to catch the eye of today's online skim hiring and decision makers, please visit www.virginiafrancoresumes.com.